Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you for staying indoors. Well, some of you maybe are doing this outdoors. It's a beautiful day. Uh, if I haven't met you before, my name's Chris Chirokas. I work for the Acton Council on Aging. Um, and I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Lawrence Lowenthal today to talk to us about Saul Bellow. Um, we are recording this program uh, to show on Acton TV. And um, if it comes out well enough. <laughs> and thank you, as always, to the friends of the Acton Council on Aging for all the support they give us. I'll take it away, Larry. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, and thank you all for joining in today for our discussion of Saul Bellow. Uh, I don't know how many of you have read Bellow, are reading Bellow. One thing I'm beginning to think about while doing this series of great American writers is the fact that writers' reputations ebb and flow. Uh, and it's, I guess, reflective of what so many of us uh, have realized in our senior citizenship years. Uh, people come, people go, uh, trends rise, trends uh, ebb. Uh, nothing ever quite stays the same. And this is haunting and yet it's, it's reality and we have to really confront it. Uh, <clears throat> at any rate, if I'm talking about uh, a series on great American writers, it is impossible to ignore Saul Bellow. <clears throat> Uh, many of you know that in the post-World War II uh, uh, evolution of American literature, Jewish writers emerged as the outstanding writers post-World War II. Uh, three in particular, uh, Bernard Malamud, uh, Philip Roth, and Saul Bellow. Uh, Bellow once jokingly referred to them as the Hart, Schaffner, and Marx of Jewish American literature. <clears throat> A lot of critics feel that Bellow, amongst the three, reigns supreme. Uh, he was the first Jewish writer in America to really crack what was called the wasp hierarchy of American letters. Uh, the only novelist to win three national book awards, the only novelist. Uh, he won the Pulitzer Prize in 1973 for Humboldt's Gift a very accessible book, one of my favorite Bella novels. Uh, he won the National Medal of Arts and the National Book Foundation's Lifetime Medal for Distinguished Contribution to American Letters. And in 1976, Saul Bellow became the first American Jewish writer to win the Nobel Prize, which is the supreme accolade, the supreme award that any writer uh, can ever hope to achieve. Uh, in the words of the Swedish Nobel Committee, referring to the adventures of Wolgi March, which I credit Chris with having read recently, it's not an easy read. <laughs> it's very challenging, uh, but they loved it. They said that this is a rich, picaresque novel, picaresque meanings, a novel that we associate with, uh, for instance, Cervantes' uh, Don Quixote. Uh, the journeys, the adventures of a open-minded adventurous uh, personage. Uh, this is a rich picaresque novel of subtle analysis of our culture, of entertaining adventures, drastic and tra tragic uh, episodes in very quick succession, interspersed with philosophic conversation, all developed by a commentator, Bellow, with a witty tongue and penetrating insight into the inner and outer complications that drive us to act or prevent us from acting and that can be called the dilemma of our age. Uh, his best known works aside from The Adventures of Olgi March, Kurtzog, published in 1974, a highly intellectual novel that amazingly proved to be a tremendous bestseller. It stayed at the top of the New York Times bestseller list for over five months. I think this says something about the openness of the American uh, and international reading public uh, at the outset of the 1960s. Um, because it's a very dense intellectual novel that people simply loved. I don't know how many of you read it. If you haven't, I urge you to take a look at it. 
Um, Henderson, The Rain King, which Crystal just told me she read as well, came out in 1959. Bellow felt that Henderson, The Rain King was his favorite novel and that Henderson really reflected uh, Bellow himself in his own mind. <clears throat> uh, the one novel that I urge everyone to read if you haven't read it <clears throat> is one of the shortest of his novels. It's called Seize the Day, came out early in 1956. It's a novella that I myself taught three times at Northeastern University. Uh, it's being taught in college classrooms all over the world. A Humboldt's Gift, again, Pulitzer Prize winner in 1975. And amazingly, a novel called Ravelstein, published in 2000, when Saul Bellow was 85 years old. Now that's amazing. <clears throat> Not only did he publish a novel at the age of 85, but according to many critics, uh, it ranks as one of his most accomplished works. <clears throat> Bellow died at 89. <clears throat> Uh, as many of you know, he lived right here in Brookline, Massachusetts for the last 12 years of his life. Uh, Bellow published his first novel called Dangling Man. Very interesting book. In 1944, even before World War II was over, it was during the time when Bellow himself was waiting to be drafted into the military service. <clears throat> uh, that was followed two years later by a very compelling and sort of creepy novel called The Victim about anti-Semitism. Uh, both novels reflect Bellow's feeling of alienation as a Canadian Jew in America, as a Jew in a predominantly Christian culture and society. Uh, these two early books also reflect the very, very deep influence on Bellow of Dostoevsky, the great Russian novelist. But Bello did not find his true voice until The Adventures of Augie March. And he wrote it essentially while living in Paris on a Guggenheim Fellowship. <clears throat> Looking back, he recalled, I was turned on like a fire hydrant in summer. Uh, <clears throat> while strolling through the streets of Paris, he would sometimes see the spectacle of water flooding down a Parisian street. And it became an inspiration for what he calls the cascade of prose that gushed out of him after the most famous opening lines of the novel. The opening of The Adventures of Orgy March is considered one of the most famous and significant openings in all of modern American literature. <clears throat> Here it is. I am an American, Chicago born. Chicago, that somber city. And go with things as I have taught myself. Freestyle, and will make the record in my own way. First to knock, first admitted. Sometimes an innocent knock, sometimes a not so innocent. Augie March has been compared by many critics to Huckleberry Finn and to Holden Caulfield from Catcher in the Rye. Two young <clears throat> boys uh, searching for their identity, searching for authenticity in a world that is really ugly, a world that is threatening not only to their sense of individuality, but almost to their sense of uh, human survival. <clears throat> now, Augie March, again, is not an easy read. It took me four <laughs> efforts before I finally plowed into the book. It was, it's, it's 600 pages, a very dense, brilliant, flowing prose. It's a heady mix of street, slang and elegant academic philosophic discourse. Uh, but it fascinated readers then and now with its breathtaking style. And this is the great genius of Saul Bellow, his amazing literary style, which I think is almost unique amongst modern American writers. 
uh, his inventiveness. Uh, the book has been named one of the 100 best novels of the 20th century by both Time Magazine and by the Modern Library. <clears throat> Uh, the novel is teeming with an army of memorable characters, dreamers, questers, bookish intellectuals, cranks, con men, fast talking salesmen, dealers, and most central of all, Augie March himself. A young, naive, open-minded, adventurous, at times amoral, roguish fellow, striving to attain his own sense of individuality in a world where so many other people are trying to get him to submit to their influence. Bellow's themes are broad and powerful. His protagonists in one shape or another all wrestle with what one, one character calls the big scale insanities of the 20th century. A lot of us are just living day to day without really placing ourselves in the context of a world that has gone in so many respects crazy. Uh, many of us have lived through World War II. I was a little boy, but <clears throat> I remember it. Uh, we have experienced two world wars in this century. We have experienced a terribly dangerous Cold War with the Soviet Union. We have experienced uh, genocide, we have experienced the Holocaust, we have experienced technology, overwhelming humanism. We have experienced almost every step of the way. Today, I think more than ever, the threat to our sense of human dignity and worth. Uh, if you just step back a little and look objectively at our current political situation, uh, it's all we can do on a day-to-day -day basis to retain a sense of objectivity and balance. I think you will agree. Fundamentally, Bello is asking the basic question. How should a decent person live in a fallen world? How can one maintain a commitment to life in the face of ever-threatening physical and spiritual death. Martin Amis, very, very popular Amer a British novelist and a very good friend of Saul Bellow, um, described Bellow as the greatest American author ever, in my view. Uh, Amos goes on to say, his sentences seem to weigh more than anyone else's. He's like a force of nature. He breaks all the rules. The people in Bellows' fiction are real people, yet the intensity of the gaze that he bathes them in, somehow through the particular, opens up into the universal. For Laura Grant, a literary critic, uh, she makes the following statement about Saul Bellow. What Bello has to tell us in his fiction was that it is worth it being alive despite everything. A typical example in Augie March. Through Augie's eyes, we discover the city of Chicago. I don't know how many of you are from Chicago. I spent four years at Northwestern University, which was also Bello's alma mater. He graduated 20 years before me. Uh, but Chicago in the 1920s, and it is a dazzlement of swanky apartments, of crummy, lousy apartments, of pool rooms, of dime stores, of boxing gyms, of music halls with girls playing Liebestad on bagpipes. Uh, when Augie and his friends have nothing else to do, they go to City Hall and they simply rise up and down in the elevator. Here is an excerpt from the novel. In the cage, we rose trapped, rubbing shoulders with big shots and operators, with commissioners, grabbers, healers, tipsters, hoodlums, wolves, fixers, plaintiffs, flat feet men in Western hats and women in lizard shoes and fur coats, hothouse and arctic drafts mixed up, root things and airs of sex, evidence of heavy feeling and systematic shaving 
of calculations, grief, not caring, and hopes of tremendous millions in concrete to be poured, or whole Mississippis of bootleg whiskey or beer. <laughs> Amazing and overwhelming prose style, to say the least. <clears throat> Bella wrote Augie March uh, at sidewalk cafes in Paris, very much like Jean-Paul Sartre uh, and Hemingway, also writing their great works at sidewalk cafes in Paris. He stayed in Europe for two years on fellowships. Uh, the great pleasure of the book, he said, was that it came easily. All I had to do was be there with buckets to catch the cascade of prose that literally flowed out of his head. Saul Bella was born June 10th, 1915. His birth name was Solomon Bellows. He was born in Lachine, Quebec, which is at that time, which was at that time a Jewish ghetto of Montreal. Montreal then, and I think even now, has a very large Jewish population. Uh, he was the son of Russian Jewish parents who came from St. Petersburg just two years before his birth. Uh, they settled in Canada. But when Bella was nine, his family moved to the Humboldt section of Chicago on the west side of the city that Bella grew to love and know intimately. Uh, it became the formal backdrop of so many of his novels. Although very deeply steeped in Jewish tradition, uh, Bella was fluent in both Yiddish and Hebrew. He learned Hebrew when he was four years old very bright. He was profoundly knowledgeable about the Bible. Nevertheless, he revolted against what he called the suffocating orthodoxy of traditional Judaism. And he found in Chicago not just a physical home, but a spiritual one as well. Now, interesting about Bello, like so many people, he was a radical leftist in his youth. He was a Trotskyite. Uh, a full-blooded believer in the communist cause. Uh, but as he aged, he became conservative to the point where he really caused a lot of controversy in his later years. And it might be one reason possibly uh, that he's not quite as much in favor today as he was, I don't know, maybe 30 years ago. I don't know, it's an interesting question. What awakened Bello to his full spiritual and intellectual vitality was simply his friendships and his relationships with other peers who were also the children of immigrants in a new country. And that whole generation, and particularly of Jewish young people, was intellectually explosive. In his own words, the children of Chicago bakers, tailors, peddlers, insurance agencies, insurance agents, pressers, cutters, grocers, the sons of families on relief, after all this was during the depression, but they were all reading very elegantly bound buckram books from the public library. And they were all, all of us were in a state of incredible enthusiasm we found ourselves on the shore of a novelistic land to which we felt we belonged. And they discovered their birthright, not through Jewish spiritual and religious tradition, but from talking simply one to the other, a whole generation of rising explosive intellectuals. And what did we talk about? We talked about the mind, we talked about society, we talked about art, we talked about religion, we talked about philosophy. And we did all of this in Chicago of all places. Eventually Chicago became for Saul Bellow what London became for Charles Dickens and what Dublin became for James Joyce. Not just a, a city with the center of the writer's life, the center of the writer's soul, 
it wasn't just a place or a background, but almost a character in its own right. To quote Bellow, Chicago, a city of brutal and poetic, blue with winter, brown with evening, crystal with frost, Chicago, this agglomeration of human fantasies. When Bellow was 17, his mother died. And he found it very difficult to overcome her death. His father remarried. And Bellow's words, I was turned loose, freed in a sense, free, but also stunned. Like someone who survives an explosion, but hasn't yet grasped what has happened. My mother's death literally disabled me for years. Bellow attended the University of Chicago, but switched to Northwestern University because it was cheaper. He hoped to study literature at Northwestern, but he found what he called the, a tweedy anti-Semitism in the English literature department. Um, and he switched his major to anthropology and sociology, uh, and he graduated with honors in 1937. Uh, interestingly, Melville Herskovitz, one of the very first Jewish professors to be head of an entire anthropology department in a major university, uh, was Bellow's mentor and ideal. Uh, Melville Herskovitz really founded, although he was white and Jewish, he really founded uh, the whole tradition of African American studies. Uh, again, just speaking personally, I arrived at Northwestern literally 20 years after Bellow left, and I majored in English and American literature. And in 1957, I found no anti Semitism in the department. I found it in fraternities where a Jew simply could not be admitted uh, to non-Jewish fraternities. And I ended up joining Phi Epsilon Pi, a Jewish fraternity. But my experience at Northwestern was idyllic. Uh, I don't think it was the same for Saul Bellow, just a mere 20 years separating us. Uh, he worked briefly during the war years for the WPA Writers Project, uh, wrote biographies of writers. He worked later for the Encyclopedia Britannica and became involved in the legendary Great Books Project. And finally, he went into the Merchant Marine in 1944 and 1945, fulfilling his military obligation. His wartime service was followed by a string of academic appointments, uh, University of Minnesota, in New York City, Princeton, and finally Boston, where he was recruited by John Silver to teach at Boston University. Uh, Bellow spent the last 12 years of his life living in Brookline, married to a woman named Janet Friedman, who was 40 years younger. Uh, she was 30 when she married Bellow at the age of 70. Uh, Amazingly, the marriage uh, endured and was happy. And uh, Bello actually became a father of a daughter, his only daughter, when he was 84 years old. Uh, he died five years later. <clears throat> She's now 21. Uh, why did Bello leave his beloved Chicago? It's an interesting biographical question. Uh, the reasons apparently are very complex. A lot of his friends had died, particularly Alan Bloom, his dearest friend. Alan Bloom, if you recall, was the author of a very best-selling book called The Closing of the American Mind. I don't know how many of you remember this book. Um, this became the subject, uh, Alan Bloom became the subject of Ravelstein, uh, Bellow's novel written when he was 85. And Bellow said, I just got tired of passing by the, the houses of dear friends who had died. He was also terribly upset at that time uh, about terrible racial tensions in Chicago, 
tensions between uh, blacks and Jews. Uh, there was a radical group then and now in the Nation of Islam, now headed by uh, Farrakhan. Um, and at one point, and I remember this clearly myself because the story and the allegation didn't disappear, uh, some members of the Nation of Islam were accusing Jewish doctors of infecting black babies with the HIV virus. <clears throat> uh, Bellow vehemently objected to what he called this blood libel in an article that he printed in the Chicago Tribune. <clears throat> Bellow's tension with the black radicals and by extension to a certain extent by the black community um, affected, I think, his reputation. Uh, he has a portrait of a black character in Mr. Samuel's Planet, which added to the racial controversy at that time. Bellow couldn't care less about political correctness. He spoke his mind. He entered into vehement uh, arguments uh, with people who represented precisely that which he found offensive. That included uh, feminists, that included student uh, radicals on campus, that included uh, post-modern uh, devotees that included multiculturalism, and all very, very conservative uh, positions. Um, his later life and his conservatism put him in constant argumentative uh, opposition with his son, Gregory. Uh, Gregory wrote um, interesting but sort of painful memoir about his father. It's called Saul Bellow's Heart, a son's memoir by Greg Bellow. This is one of a number of memoirs written by children of famous writers. Uh, this is a whole phenomenon that I'm not too clear about. Why, what motivates William Styron's daughter, Alexandra, to write a sort of scathing biography, a memoir of her father, or, or Franz Wright writing bitter uh, memories about his father, the famous poet, James Wright. Uh, J.D. Salinger's daughter, um, writing Dreamcatcher. He never spoke to her again after the publication of that book. It's, it's a phenomenon, but the book is worth reading. It, it gives really interesting insights uh, into uh, the great writer. And Greg Bellow says, look, we loved each other. Uh, I certainly admired his literary genius, but I can't help but uh, reveal what I consider to be his parental failures. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> explaining why he continued to teach even into his 80s, uh, even though he was one of the most financially successful of all American writers, Bella made an interesting comment. <clears throat> You're all alone when you're a writer. Sometimes you feel you just need a, a humanity bath. Even a ride on the subway might do that. But it's much more interesting to talk about books. After all, that's what life used to be for writers. They talk books, they talk politics, history, America. Nothing can replace that. In a long and unusually productive career, Bellow dodged a number of the pitfalls and snares that entangled other American writers. He drank, but he was not an alcoholic, unlike Hemingway, unlike Fitzgerald, unlike William Faulkner, who were total alcoholics. Uh, though he was psychoanalyzed four times and even put himself into an orgone box. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the theories of Wilhelm Reich, uh, but he was incredibly robust and healthy. Uh, his ego was strong, his physical being was strong. Uh, like many writers, Saul Bellow obviously proved to be a very difficult man to live with. Difficult as a husband, difficult as a father. Uh, this is simply um, the, the phenomenon 
of what it means to be a writer. A writer functions in isolation and all the children that have written memoirs of their brilliant writer fathers all mention that when that door closed in the morning, you were not to disturb the father behind that door. And he could be there all day long, even through supper. That's the fate of being a writer. Saul Bellow was married five times. Uh, he fathered four children, including his only daughter when he was 84. Uh, but Bellow's works obviously speak for themselves, aside from whatever flaws personally that he may have had. Uh, Henderson, the Rain King, um, had a more ambitious canvas than even Augie March, um, the story of an American millionaire who goes to Africa to find some kind of regeneration for his uh, failing soul. Uh, Bellow had never been to Africa, but he, re he regarded this novel as a turning point. He said of Augie March, Augie was a little unruly and out of control. With Henderson, I had full command of my creative powers. Uh, Henderson was followed by Herzog in 1964. Herzog is kind of every man uh, who is cuckolded by his wife and his best friend. And he falls into a state of serious depression. He's taken by an epistolatory fit, meaning uh, he's got a compulsion to write letters. Uh, and the letters, are, the letters are written to not only friends, but all kinds of famous people, uh, both living and dead. Uh, he writes grieving, biting, ironic, and rambunctious letters, not only to his friends and acquaintances, but also to great men the giants of thought who formed his mind. Looking back on that book, Bellow said, Herzog was just a brainstorm. One day I found myself writing letters all over the place. Then it occurred to me that it was a very good idea for writing a book about the mental condition of the country and of its educated class. Um, there's one passage in Herzog. And the, the, why so many people fell in love with the book all over the world, I think is because of the incredible honesty of the protagonist. He looks deep within himself and finds <laughs> ruination, almost total ruination, but he doesn't shy away from it. He doesn't lie to himself about it. And, I think this is what is so impressive to the reader. Uh, here's one example. Resuming his self-examination, he admitted, this is Herzog speaking, but it could have as well be Bellow speaking. This is to me reflective of Bellow, the writer, as well as Herzog, his creation. Resuming his self-examination, he admitted that he'd been a bad husband twice. He's got two more divorces ahead of him. Daisy, his first wife, he had treated miserably. Madeline, his second, had tried to do him in. To his son and his daughter, he was a loving but bad father. To his own parents, he had been an ungrateful child. To his country, an indifferent citizen. To his brothers and sister, affectionate but remote. With his friends, an egotist. With love, lazy. With brightness, dull. With power, passive with his own soul, evasive, satisfied with his own severity, positively enjoying the hardness and factual rigor of his self-judgment, he lay on his sofa, his arms rising behind him, his legs extended without aim. But how charming we remain, notwithstanding. A true of Bello, incredibly charming, man, despite whatever flaws one would see in him. Um, and again, number one bestseller on the New York Times list for almost five months made him not only even more famous, but made him
quite wealthy. He wrote Mr. Sandler's Planet, which I'm sure many of you probably read at the time, 1969. It's about a survivor of the Holocaust, living and ruminating in New York City. Uh, Bella won his third National Book Award. Humboldt's Gift in 1975 proved again highly successful, it won the Pulitzer Prize. It's one of my favorite Bellow novels. It's quite accessible. Uh, it's about a writer who's trying desperately to come to terms with the death of one of his dearest friends, von Humboldt Fleischer, modeled on the famous poet Delmore Schwartz, who indeed was one of Bellow's dearest friends. Uh, Upon winning the Nobel Prize, the Swedish committee praised the novel for its exuberant ideas, its flashing irony, its hilarious comedy, and its burning compassion. Bello, after the, after the Nobel Prize in 1976, was placed in the same category uh, with Hemingway and with Faulkner. Again, uh, I don't think that would hold true now. Hemingway and Faulkner are incredibly, their reputations are incredibly strong. Notice last night, uh, Joe Biden mentioned Hemingway in his speech to the nation. Uh, Bella may have faded in the subsequent years. I urge everyone uh, if you've read absolutely nothing by Saul Bellow, pick up Seize the Day. It's more a novella than a novel. Again, I have taught it three times at Northeastern. The students really like it, even though it's a very sad and depressing story. Uh, the main character, Tommy Wilhelm, is one of life's ultimate losers. Um, and yet you can't put the book down. Uh, many critics feel that this is Bellow's finest work. The painfully exact American tragedy of our affluent day, as one called it. The novel is tightly written. It's superbly resonant in all of its symbols. Uh, it takes place in New York on the Upper West Side. Uh, Tommy Wilhelm has a terrible relationship with his father, very much like Bellow's own strained, terrible relationship with his father. Uh, there are scenes of the Broadway traffic. I'm from New York City. I grew up in New York City. The sheer flow of humanity up and down the main streets. Uh, at one point, Tommy sees the great crowds walking in New York, and he seems to see in every face the refinement of one particular motive or essence. I labor, I spend, I strive, I design, I love, I cling, I uphold, I give way, I envy, I long, I scorn, I die, I hide, I want. Tommy is a fallen non-hero. He's out of a job. He's near broke. He's separated from his wife and children, uh, although still providing support. He's unable to marry his Catholic girlfriend. He's held in utter contempt by his unloving and cruel father who refuses to help him in his most desperate moments, even with words of consolation and encouragement and love. And his last money is fleeced out of him by a charismatic uh, huckster named Dr. Tamkin. Uh, Tommy is a drowning man, utterly submerged in failure, uh, deeply concerned with the debilitating quality of daily life between what he calls the accident of birth and the fatal sickness of death. At his lowest, most despairing moment, Tommy cries out, oh God, let me out of my trouble. Let me out of my thoughts and let me do something better with myself. For all the time I wasted, 
I am very sorry. Let me out of this clutch and into a different life, for I am all old up. Have mercy. But there is no mercy, not from the father, not from the wife, not from Dr. Temkin. At the end of the novel, Tommy, in total despair, wanders into a funeral house. And he gazes upon the body of the deceased, a total stranger. And he begins to weep, sobbing. The finale of this small masterpiece. The music poured into him where he had hidden himself in the center of a crowd by the great and happy oblivion of tears. He heard it and sank deeper into sorrow through torn sobs and cries toward the consummation of his heart's ultimate need. This final sentence has been debated by critics for decades. Um, one of the most mysterious endings of any of Bellow's novels. Uh, I have the sense that Tommy at the very end of the novel sinks into total submergence into sorrow, but his heart's ultimate need is to connect with all of humanity. There isn't a single human being that hasn't experienced profound sorrow. Uh, it was made, the, the, the novel was made into a TV film starring of all people as Tommy Wilhelm, Robin Williams, who interestingly, as we know, committed suicide out of what clearly was a very deep depression. Uh, Robin Williams gave a brilliant performance with a powerful Jewish actor named Joseph Wiseman playing his father. Uh, toward the end of his life, Bello said that his approach to art was that of an alien newly arrived on earth. I've never seen the world before. Now I am seeing it. And it's a beautiful, marvelous gift enchanting reality. And when the end comes, I was told by the cleverest people I know that it would all vanish. I'm not absolutely convinced of that, he said. If you ask me if I believed in life after death, I would say I was an agnostic. Uh, Bello wrote to me, one of the most beautiful stories in modern American literature. It's called The Old System. And it's about a family, a Jewish family in Chicago that falls out. And the oldest brother is enormously successful, but he has a bitter estrangement from his sister. Tina. Now the brother is a deeply religious man and he is simply desperate to overcome the estrangement with his sister, especially at Yom Kippur, uh, the high holy day for the Jewish people, a day in which you are expected, you are commanded to apologize for whatever misdeeds you have done to alienate a friend or a family member. And no matter how he tries, the brother cannot reconcile with his sister. She is simply adamant. She feels he has uh, cheated her and her other siblings out of money that was owed them. He goes to the synagogue after being repudiated by his sister. He breaks into tears right near the ark. Finally, the sister becomes fatally ill. Uh, she's on her deathbed. She tells her brother through other siblings that he can come and visit her and reconcile if he brings a satchel full of money. He's so desperate to overcome the estrangement that he puts all the money into a satchel and goes to visit her in the hospital. 
Then Tina's private nurse opened the door and beckoned to Isaac. He hurried in and stopped with a suffocated look. Her upper body was wasted and yellow. Her belly was huge and the growth in her legs, her ankles were swollen. Her distorted feet had freed themselves from the cover. The soles like clay. The skin was tight on her skull. The hair was white. An intravenous tube was taped to her arm and other tubes from her body into excretory jars beneath the bed. He laid the briefcase before her. It had not been unstrapped. Her black eyes were impossible to understand. She was looking at Isaac, her brother, Tina, he says. She responds, I wondered. Isaac tells his sister, the money's all there. But she swept the briefcase from her and in a choked voice said, no, take it. He went to kiss her. Her free arm was lifted and tried to embrace him. She was too feeble, too drugged. He felt the bones of his obese sister. Death, the end, the grave. They were weeping. And Mutt, the other brother, turning away at the feet of the bed, his mouth twisted open and the tears running from his eyes. Tina's tears were much thicker and slower. And the ending of the story is a rumination by Dr. Braun, who is narrating this whole saga. And to me, it's one of the most beautiful pieces of literary prose that we have in our modern American uh, canon. And Dr. Braun, bitterly moved, tried to grasp what emotions were. What good were they? What were they for? And no one wanted them now. Perhaps the cold eye was better on life, on death. But again, the cold of the eye would be proportional to the degree of heat within. But once humankind had grasped its own idea that it was human and human through such passions, it began to exploit, to play, to disturb for the sake of exciting disturbance, to make an uproar a crude circus of feelings. So the bronze wept for Tina's death. Isaac held his mother's ring in his hand. Dr. Braun too had tears in his eyes. Oh, these Jews, these Jews, their feelings, their heart. Dr. Braun often wanted nothing more than to stop all this. For what came of it? One after another, you gave over your dying. One by one, they went, you went, childhood, family, friendship, love were stifled in the grave. And these tears, when you wept them from the heart, you felt you justified something, understood something. But what did you understand? Again, nothing. It was only an intimation of understanding, a promise that mankind might, might, mind you, eventually, through its gift, which might, might again, be a divine gift, comprehend why it lives. Why life? Why death? Like all great writers, Bello was unable to provide definitive answers to the meaning of life. But like all great writers, I suggest he certainly knew how to ask the right questions. In his Nobel Prize winning speech in 1976, Bello beautifully expressed his basic credo as an artist and as a writer. Bella referred to the power of art to elevate and enlarge the human spirit. Art appeals to that part of our being, which is a gift, not an acquisition. 
It appeals to our capacity for delight and wonder, our sense of pity and pain, to the latent feeling of friendship with all creation, and to the subtle but invincible conviction of solidarity that knits together the loneliness of innumerable hearts, which binds together all humanity, the dead to the living and the living to the unborn. The feeling individuals may seem weak. The feeling individual may seem weak, like Herzog, like Tommy Wilhelm. He seems to feel nothing but his weakness. But if he accepted his weakness and his separateness and descended into himself, intensifying his loneliness, he discovered solidarity with other isolated creatures. Uh, any responses, questions? I'm certainly interested in any personal experience you've had with Saul Bellow, even either in the past or the present. Um, I leave it open to your responses. Well, I I really appreciate it. It seems like, well, can I say something? Yeah, of course. It seems like the idea of solidarity is something that of connection with all of life with, you know, that seems to be a basic truth that lots of different philosophies and religions, people, they seem to come to that from all different directions. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know, I was just very happy to hear that he kind of felt those connections too and how important, he seems like an amazing man. I think you gave us a beautiful picture, thank you. Why do we read novels? Why do we read poetry? Why do we read short stories? Many of us grew up reading international literature. We read Chekhov, we read Dostoevsky, we read Turgenev, we read Balzac, we read uh, Proust. And what is the result? Uh, uh, your, I'm sorry, your name? What, what is your name? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, I can't. Can you hear me, by Are the way? Are you talking to me? Yes, yes. What's your My name? connection keeps breaking up, so. Oh, okay. Uh, but th th thank you so much for raising this, this point, uh, because it is really, in my mind, uh, the main function of art, whether it is pictorial art, whether it's literary art, whether it's musical art, it is to connect. Uh, that is the purpose. We read literature, we listen to music, we look at paintings in order to connect not only to the rest of humanity, but to the world itself. We connect with nature. We appreciate the beauty of nature. We find a sense of spirituality simply in the beauty of our physical environment. But most of all, and most difficult of all, we try to connect with other human beings. What are we all experiencing now as we speak? A, a fractured country, a fractured population, where families are no longer speaking to members within the family. Mothers are no longer speaking to their daughters. Fathers are no longer speaking to their sons because we have become utterly fractured in our beliefs, uh, our political attitudes, our voting patterns. 
And that's why I thought Joe Biden's speech last night was tremendous. Uh, this is a pretty simple guy. He's no intellectual, but he's speaking directly, not only to Americans, but to the world at large. If we don't accept each other, if we don't pull together, we're gonna lose. The negative forces that defy our sense of human worth and dignity are gonna win. So art, as artists have tried to explain for hundreds of years, art is designed to overcome these differences and connect us not only to other people, but to the world at large. So thank you, uh, I appreciate that. Uh, well, again, I want to express my appreciation uh, uh, for your joining in today. Uh, I hope I'm not indulging my own private passion for literature. Uh, uh, sometimes I feel I'm sort of indulging myself rather than, <laughs> than the people who join in, but um, thank you so much for being here today. It really uh, it means a lot to me. And I wish you all a very happy weekend. Please continue to stay well. Make sure you're all vaccinated. I have my second vaccination after uh, experiencing COVID-19. Fortunately, I'm one of the lucky ones. Uh, again, uh, anything else before we, before we leave? Uh, Terry. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right, Chris, thanks so much for this. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. We'll see you the next time, uh, March 26th for yes. Sylvia Plath. Great. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye bye. Bye. Hi, Paul. <laughs> Hi, Marianne. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Bye.